bringing you a Friday the 13th broadcast with a tribute to Dr. Sabine Hassenfelder, who just released another video. I have claimed, and now I'm willing to double my bet, that Dr. Hassenfelder is at the forefront of physics today. It blows me away what actually is going on in physics. I do take a hard line, but only on a very specific vector that has to do with ultra deep space geometry. I have nothing at all against physics and the level of expertise and sheer beauty. It is beautiful. And Dr. Hassenfelder has pointed out the danger of that, that it is actually quite entrancing. But it is important in my mind, as a geometer, exploring the truth of the universe to point out that heaven is not like earth. It sounds almost biblical, but this is pure, brutal, hardline logic. That the geometry that we have been using on earth is actually designed for earth. It certainly has been, what I just said, cannot be denied. What troubles, what, what could, you, you get the innuendo, it's only for Earth. Well, actually, you see, that flies in the face of astrophysics, which continues to extend our linear algebra system to explore heaven. That's only going to work to a threshold. And when you cross that threshold, it can't work because linearity itself breaks down. So I'm going to point out something that Dr. Hussenfelder imparted to us, the world, just two days ago, according to the label. In other words, January 11th of this year. And today is January 13th, Friday the 13th. The apparition of the comet the only the third interloper hyperbolic comet that's ever been discovered yesterday, which is right between, I know I'm doing astrology, I told you, in the last lecture that I was going to do this. If you didn't see the last lecture, this could blow your mind, so let me slow down here. There is a comet passing by the Earth right now. That's it's, it's the rarest thing that's ever been seen in astrophysics because it, there's only been three of these. But you see, I'm being pre prejudiced here according to what I happen to like. And I've never really been that interested in comets. I am interested potentially in anything that's flying around over my head. And these comets are absolutely freaking fascinating to the just drag you off of whatever you're doing and take you away forever. This is what I look for. Something that blows your goddamned mind out. This is a comet, which nobody knows what these things are. They're made of ice, water. They have water on them. It took me decades to realize that that was true. And I'm not sure how long we've absolutely known it. We know it now. We've sent probes to these things. Well, this one is an interloper. It's not Halley's Comet. That's a certain type of periodic comet. Ooh, that one comes every like 75 years. Mark Twain has a very interesting tale that intertwines with Halley's Comet. And Halley's Comet is a comet those things are the subject of the deepest astrology. And there is a goddamned, pardon my French, and my apologies to the French, but this is how I was raised. It's not my fault, okay? I don't blame the French. Like, or they made up stupid things to say. Is that what we're saying? Pardon my French? I just said, fuck. Oh, pardon my French? <laughs> but Dr. Hassenfelder... Uh, produced this in this is a landmark lecture this is going to change the course of science because of what she divulged that I can explain to you right now uh, she, she hit the nail right on the head she's talking about special relativity and the name of her broadcast just two days ago right on the other side of the comet yeah 
Kepler was an astrologer, so don't look at me like, oh, why does he wear those dark glasses? He's he's a cultist. <laughs> yeah, NASA. See that? I belong to that cult. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, darling. So Dr. Hassenfelder just made science history. Together, we, we will make science history. She said it. She said what I've been saying. And this, if this doesn't blow your socks off, it's because you're not a real scientist, so this is it for everything. This is for all the cookies, all the money, all the prestige, all the power, and the fate of humanity. The next month, year, ten years, a thousand years is going to be determined by what Dr. Hussenfelder said two days ago that I am going to explain to you. The title of this, <laughs> I have allergenic eyes is why I wear these, okay? I'm asthmatic, I'm old. So pity me and don't send me money though. Because I won't open the envelope, I'm that far gone. <laughs> so this is called Special Relativity and there's a subheading and this is the greatest physicist active in the world today. According to me, and if I say she is, she is. Special relativity, this is why you misunderstand it. Holy shit. I've already seen this once before and I had to see it again. I saw it just a couple of hours ago. And I've been freaking out ever since because... I thought that I heard her. I may have been walking around. I listened to lectures all day. And Hasenfelder, <laughs> you don't want to miss her lectures. Just, And it's for entertainment for me because she doesn't have any answers. Well, actually, this time, she actually, she doesn't have the answer. But she says that what the answer has to be. And that's the answer that I discovered this year. So Dr. Hassenfelder basically discovered it. She doesn't know that it's been discovered. But here's what she said. This is a 21 minute long, 21 minutes and 14 seconds is Dr. Hassenfelder's lecture on special relativity just two days ago before the comet. <laughs> the comet, the Zwicky comet. The Fritz Zwicky interloper comet on a hyperbolic trajectory, only the third since Borisov and Oumuamua. Those are the only three Zwicky, Oumuamua, and Borisov. Which, by the way, Borisov, a, a hyperbolic inter interloper comet, this is a comet that'll never come back. It's not Halley's comet. It's not one of these periodic comets, 75 years or ever many years. They all vary on an elliptical orbit, but some of them are not elliptical. Well, for a comet, there are only two choices. Well, actually three. They burn up. <laughs> they burn up is what they usually do. And they all do eventually, I guess. Except, But not. no one knows about the hyperbolic ones. They're interlopers. This means it's basically an alien rock. It's, it has ice. That's why they have tails. This is water ice. Is these things freak everybody out. It's not just me. I'm just jumping on the bandwagon because I'm getting something out of it now. Kepler would be right at my side. We would be marching forward to the king right now. Talking about Dr. Hassenfelder in Wittenberg or Hamburg or Stockholm or wherever she lives, Frankfurt. And and and, and we'd be and we would collect ducats, we would have women, we would party forever. And get our way with our telescopes. We'd be doing research. Our lives would be fulfilled. This is what's happening. And you can, you're can. you very, very blessed. I mean, I, I'll use the religion. It's not luck. Well, I mean, yes, it's superpositional. Well, that's why we have astrology. Well, Dr. Hassenfelder is not really into astrology. I, I fear this woman, okay? If I were in her class... I would be her fucking pet, and she'd be beating me over the head with sticks. Just because, no, Sam, I don't think we need any humor here. You're trying to do this serious, right? I'm like, shit, fuck me. Oh, God. 
She'd be right every time. I'd be flipping out. I, I got to do better. Now I, I'm pathetic, you know. Oh. <laughs> I'm a cut up. She she's not putting up with that shit. You know, I talk a big streak, but I think the uh, Doctor Osenfelder. For one thing, I don't know if you noticed it. She's German. <laughs> yeah, no. I, 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 no. It's like the British I, or the French or the Italians or the Russians. I just, I, I step down, okay? I'm down on my knees. I'm down on my face. I'm get, trying to get away. I know it's going to happen. Uh, I, oh, come here, Sam. We have something to say to you. Oh, no, 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 you don't. Oh, I, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> so let me share this with you. So it's 21 minutes long at 15 minutes and 43 seconds. She says it, and I quote, just two days ago before the comet. That's true. <laughs> this is because gravity is not a force. Gravity is caused by the curvature of space-time. That's incorrect, and she knows it. Einstein knew too. That's not true. If you say that that's true, you get what she showed us and what everyone knows is true because you just gave in right here. Oh, yeah. It's the curvature of space-time. And now look, it's hyperbolic, this, that. No one can understand it. Permanent confusion. It's impossible that this is actually something that anybody you could share with a child no they would go insane they would hate you but she just says it and that's the litany and i am here to tell you the correct answer that's almost true so what's the correct answer this is your multiple choice question and there are three choices a b or c and I'm going to give you the question. It's just a statement, okay? Now just listen to what Dr. Hassenfelder said. Because I'm not going to say that it's true or false or anything else. I'm just going to say it again. This is from two days ago at 15 minutes and 43 seconds about special relativity. She has a bobblehead Einstein next to a red phone next to her left arm through this whole thing, one of the greatest presentation sequences I think I'll ever see. This is, this is better than the Olympics. This is more important than the Pope coming out on some, whatever he does. And, and, and so I'm just going to say it, okay? Ready? Here it goes. This is because gravity is not a force Gravity is caused by the curvature of space-time. And now A, B, or C. That is correct. That's A. B, that is incorrect. Or C, the best answer will be of the form A, B. Turn that into two kets. Ket A, proportion ket B, superposition. What's your answer, A, B, or C? Did you say C? You are incorrect. It's B and C. B and C. She is incorrect in quoting this. As she did, it's not true. There is no such thing as the curvature of space-time. And now, for your graduate Thesis question, this is it. This is your dissertation for all the marbles. What is the right way to say that? Let me give it to you again incorrectly the way Einstein said it. I, I insist that when Einstein and Sabine, only one of whom is alive, <laughs> here's what I'm about to say. They will both agree and follow this. So let's see if you're as smart as Hassenfelder and Einstein, who I claim would get this wrong, but then when I tell them the right answer, it's not C, 
it's B and C, the, they would understand instantly after I tell you what I'm about to tell you. The correct way to say that is this is because gravity is not a force because it's a pseudo force because it's due to the curvature of space and that generates a pseudo force not a motive force. Gravity is actually caused by the curvature of space. The curvature of space. Not space-time. Because one of those has to be linear. And Einstein taught us that you have to choose one of them. But which one you choose is up to you. But whichever one you choose, if you want to use his hyperbolic solution, one of them has to be negative. And this is a 3-1 split on three straight lines for space and one for time. Space-time is to turn time negative, to hyperbolicize space, to get the four-part hyperbolic curve of space-time so that you can plot in one of two modes for time. And what Hassenfelder taught us and showed us, the most beautiful presentation I have ever seen on special relativity. And she's right. This is also gravity. There's no difference. It's the curvature of space to the proportion that you linearize time. That's what Einstein did. He linearized time. That's it. That's okay. But that means that space is curved. What it does not mean is that space-time is curved. That's impossible. Otherwise, you would not be able to explain the flight of the photon and the quantum paradox, which I have already decoded and explained. So let's do it again. The flight of the photon is linearity. It's the photon detaching from the star and going right into your eye. That's a straight line photon. Space-time would get rid of that. That's why you have the light cone. That's absurd. You drew a graph that you have imaginary space on your graph where nothing will ever go. That means you got it wrong, Charlie. Space-time curvature is incorrect geometry. Space is curved, but time is not. Time is dead straight, but that's an incomplete statement. Time is dead straight to the proportion that space is curved. And that is actually the geometric solution to the definition and the reason for calculus is because of the incommensurability between the linear flight of the photon and the spherical wave front, which are simultaneous. And that's called superpositional state logic. It means you have to split your mind where one part you already have. The straight line flight of the photon. That's linear. So it's that is time. The photon getting from the star, the electronic shell of the atom in that star from an orbital emitted an energy packet that drifted with centrifugal force and was stretched because the universe is rotating. But it still went in a straight line. How do you explain that? How do you explain that straight line? You don't. You just accept it. 
But in order to see it, explain it, and be able to use it geometrically and numerically and computationally with linear vision, you have to be able to see the sphere at the same, at the same. It's doing both. So space-time is not curved. Space is. And the cause of that is the proton. That is the only thing that bends space. And now you need to balance on the conservation of energy. That may not be a force, gravity. Uh, yes, it is. With a different data type. There are two forces in the universe. One has to do with space and it manifests as curvature. That is an imbalance. And the other one is time and that's measured by energy, motion, and angular momentum. And the curvature of space balances on the manifestation of time, motion, momentum, energy. The photon is an energy packet. You have to say packet. It's not a point. But in order to understand what it is instead, you need a new geometry. That is what I discovered. It's called spherical geometry. And let's go through it now very quickly to close this out. That's 22 minutes. We'll be done by 40 minutes. We're now going to bootstrap the universe prior to Euclid. Draw your straight line. It has two infinities. Since it has two, it has a balance point at the center. Call that zero. Now you can draw your numbers. The index of linear separation in space is the straight line. Now erase it. You know why? Because now you have the center of the universe. And what's that? We're now going to bootstrap it. That, by the way, was the antipodal... <laughs> I knew I'd do that. The antipodal theorem that I discovered that proves that linear space is embedded in spherical space. You see it, right? Because when you draw a line, it has two infinities. That's the definition of the diameter of a sphere. It has a center. That's the definition of add and subtract. Zero is at the center of that line. You erase the line, you scratch out the zero, and you imaginify the point. Now we're going to create the universe in multiplicative space not linear space. And this is how you do it, and this is what Euclid and Einstein could not see. You start over because you're not going to get any solutions until you have a two-component number, one for time and one for space. You have to reconstruct your algebra to get time and space as two different data types. Simultaneity is the study of event space. That's how Einstein began in Switzerland. I believe it was Basel. He was studying train schedules. And across the border in France, so was Henri Poincaré. They were studying train schedules. Well, the stars are now thought to be, not stars, galaxies, are thought to be trains speeding away from each other, right? They're trains. That's where all the Gedanken experiment talk about trains. That's because it's not talking about spatial separation anymore. It's talking about event separation. The hyperbolic construction of space-time is doubly curved. That's a mistake. That's why it's hyperbolic. You don't want that. You start over with a straight line, erase it. Because now you have a sphere at, with a center, but it's not a point. We're not saying that. 
And now we start over with a number system in multiplicative space. That's multiply and divide, not add and subtract. That is isolated to the line. It's isometric with the line. But it doesn't extend to the sphere. That's multiply and divide. That's why there's no division by zero. Watch. You have a point and you have an edge. The edge is an unbounded sphere. Give it a number. Infinity. Now you have to give the other edge, the center, a number. One over infinity. Multiply them. It makes one. That divides space into two parts. That is a sphere. The numbers on the inside are fractions less than one, and the numbers on the outside are whole counting numbers. Max Planck says that is the quantum number system of the sphere. Because the numbers going in are wavelength, and the numbers going out are frequency. And you know what the lowest frequency in the universe is? Two. That's the index of multiplicative spherical space, which is redundant. You can say it either way, just as you can say linear additive space or spherical multiplicative space. They overlap. The line is embedded in the sphere. Now we need a two-component number. Infinity over one is the edge. The center is one over infinity. That's called proportionality on unity. So those two numbers multiply to the sphere. You now have a finite closed universe with a coherent rational closed number system of linear rational numbers. And you can recover all of your linear madness. It's an infinitely irrational line, but it is embedded. The sphere has unity. It's the number one. You know what it used to be in our linear system? Two tau. That's an irrational number. It's not irrational anymore. Einstein's curvature of space can be unitized to one. Max Planck says that one is light speed. So the flight of the photon from the surface of that sphere, that sphere is an atom. It has shells of numbers going out and, sh and parts of time on the surface. What's in the interior? The numbers are not going in. They're going perpendicular with gamma ray frequency all the way down to radio wave frequency, down to the number two. The lowest frequency the universe can ever have is frequency two, the golden oscillator. Establishing a 2-1 harmonic between space and time on the sphere, but as far as linear distance, when that photon departs and goes out, why does it go out at that speed? From centrifugal force, Emmy Nurter proved that. That centrifugal force conservation of angular momentum on in-spin gravity contraction. That's why you see time. It always goes out. And space always goes in. The in-out axis is the only axis that replaces the 3D axial system with one axis, infinity to outfinity in all directions defines gravity. And it defines magnetism at the proton level. They are exactly the same phenomenon. Magnetism and gravity are the same thing. On Emmy Nurter's symmetry of conservation force, on the only force that's conserved, energy is derived from it. Every form of symmetry is derived from this one. Angular 
Momentum! Space bends that. And energy manifests it. And that defines the electron. And that will define the photon, which is a piece of the electron that detaches and exhibits centrifugal force until it reaches your eye or telescope on a spherical wavefront that collapses against special relativity. And that's the end of special relativity. We solved it. You now have to split your mind and then synthesize space and time as perpendicular numbers. Perpendicular means reciprocal. Two over one is the first frequency. Generating one over two on the sphere, that's wavelength. And that's where time is. Space expands because time escapes. So it's not space expansion. It's space-time rotation. It's not curved. It's rotating in. That has to be compensated somewhere. You can't see that. That's outspin time space. That's the definition of why you can't see the edge. Because your mind won't let you, you're seeing centrifugal force. And when you look at the universe, you're looking in because everything is being sucked in by the protons. The supermassive black hole proves that. And now for the Big Bang, you need another solution. You only got half. You now need the big event. Which came first? The big event or the Big Bang? It didn't explode. It did not explode. The universe began by being energized. It can't expand. It's finite. We just proved it and we proved how you can see general relativity. You don't need hyperbolic inside-out space, and you deafen the fuckly don't need calculus. This is the integral solution. I have already proved that. This redefines the calculus for the first time in history. The correct definition of the calculus is seen top-down, not bottom-up. We began with the differential. You have to begin with the integral and then figure out what the derivative is and then get the anti-derivative from that. Not the way we've been doing it. That way you go insane. Georg Cantor proved that. You're going to encounter linear infinity. That's zero. And every other number on the line to infinity is irrational. But embedded in that is a lower order infinity of numbers. But it's not infinite. It's the rational numbers. It's not infinite going in. It stops before zero. There is a lowest number. That is two. And the highest number is one half. One on one side of one. From zero to one, the biggest number is one half. There's nothing between one half and one in that sense. And there's nothing between one. You understand that's the surface of the sphere. That is the center of the universe. And there's no interior. And here's why. And this is the bootstrap theorem. Go back to the line. Draw it. Get the two infinities. Now you can see. You rotate the line. You have a sphere. Erase the line. Erase the point, And erase the sphere at the edge. And now all you have is the edge in the center and you don't know what they are. The edge is infinity over 1 and infinity is an imaginary number. It represents imaginary space and imaginary anything else. And now the center is 1 over infinity. Is that 0? No. 
And that's the correct definition of infinity. It's a dual two component number system infinity. And that's the only infinity there is. The rest are derivative infinities on the line. And that's why you're going insane with calculus. And Dr. Hussenfelter blew the top off and now I have my opening. Dr. Hussenfelder is wrong. But she's more right than anybody has ever been. And I'm the only man that can step past Dr. Hussenfelder now and solve it. To end this and start a new course of solution space answers. It's with spherical geometry that I'll teach you beginning in the next lecture. That's 35 minutes. I beat my record. Thank you, Dr. Sabine. I'm highly indebted to you for this tremendous insight. I got the answer, but you showed how to get it out. That's what's going to happen now. This is Anagalactic. We'll be right back.